thank you so much for the wonderful turnout. Um, it's very impressive and, and it's delightful to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about sort of combine two things today. Um, one of my research interests, which I've got my PhD on and I continue to work with, is the Asian city. Um, we cover vibrancy, um, excitement, and I think it's a very valuable model for Western cities to look at how you deal with rapid change um, in Asia. Um, but I'm combining it with a um, studio I ran in collaboration with Taipei University in Taipei. So you also get a little bit of a feel about what an RMIT design studio might be like and how our students work there. Um, the studio was called Taipei Operations, and here's a book that was published at the end of it. It was a, a joint workshop for three months held in Taipei. It was an exhibition which was held in Taipei and also in Melbourne, and it's a book. So it has many incarnations. And it really represents, I suppose, a field or a type of urbanism which we call from bottom up. Um, but before I get there, I'll, I'll just tell you some of the things that I thought about when I was working on this, this workshop with my colleagues. One, I'm not from Asia, and I was a bit worried about bringing students over and how I could act responsibly as an architect. I had no local knowledge. So what did I really have to offer? Um, I was a bit concerned um, of the sort of uh, stereotype of the Asian city, that it's rapidly growing, chaotic, ad hoc. And, you know, that's what we all say, but I was convinced that there was a sort of sense of order and understanding in a way, in a system of how it grew and changed and will continue to develop, but it was necessary to figure out how that worked. So, um, these were some of the things that we, we started when we worked out in the workshop. Um, and this is, in a sense, how many urban designers work. They work from the top down. They get a big plan of the city, they do big broad stroke marks. They don't really understand the people, the culture, what differentiates one place from another. And this was the exact opposite approach, which I think is the, the basis of most Western urban design that I wanted to avoid. Because quite frankly, we could have stayed in Melbourne. Because you know, this map of Taipei could be Melbourne, could be Jakarta, could be anywhere. And a sort of a little, I think, oh, it's brighter up there, that's good. Um, and I'll come back to this slide. And if you zoom in and we sort of think of how buildings and culture work, you know, it's all very organized with streets. And has anyone here ever been to Taipei? You have. It doesn't look like that at all, does it? It's wild. So, so I think one of the things that, that I sort of need to start off with, it's been a long-term interest with me, that maps lie. We, we trust them, but they reflect the biases of the map maker. So this is all orderly, this is the urban designers. But what's nice about this map is it's not as orderly as it looks, and I'll tell you about it afterwards. Because the Taipei city planners were extraordinary. All these buildings with a single hatching are the illegal buildings, but the Taipei government actually draws in the illegal ones, which I think is charming. So that all of that sort of ad hoc or temporary street culture, they draw. And when you ask them, how could they do that? They say it's the spirit of Taipei. <laughs> this is all the food that we like to eat. You can eat every five meters in Taipei, best food in the world. And you know they can't get rid of it, but how do you deal with it? So this is what we began to understand. So the sorts of exercises that we set were really very simple. And this is the basis of my PhD, because I think the best research tool that we have is our eyes. To open our eyes, to look around us, and to begin to understand why things are the way they are, to question them, and then sort of see where we might or might not be needed as designers. So some things we can help, some things we can't. And so some of our observation exercises, all of them were based on the specificity of being there. Oh, there's a lot of people outside. Well, maybe they're not for us. Uh, but of being um, specific to time and place. So I didn't want to have that distancing device of the plan. We were there, we were out in the streets. And my students from Melbourne first started on the internet, but I went crazy. It's like, why did we go all this way to use the internet? To go out in the street, get on the back of your colleagues' motorbikes. So some of the ways that we looked were by walking. Again, a very simple tool. And these are four students taking a walk, two Taiwanese, two Australian. They all start at the same point. 
7-Eleven is always the destination for everyone. And, and as you notice, that every spot along the way has something to do with food. I mean, so, uh, except for, for one of the, the slender women from Australia. So that's some people's maps. Or you might start looking, as this student did, at how a stray dog might look at the city from knee height and taking a random route through a market. A lot of these things are how do we begin to look differently? How do we begin to look fresh? So the Australian students have never been there, but the Taiwanese really needed to look fresh at their city. So maybe we could give them those techniques. Um, start looking at, at objects or things for normal in the city, such as signage and labeling, horizontal, vertical. Um, and passing judgment, illegible, what might be a more legible alternative. Um, looking at different times of day, because cities are really organic and dynamic structures, so they're different in the morning, in the afternoon, at night, in rush hour on a Sunday. So I think these are tools. And here's again some of these almost obsessive investigations, which is looking at an intersection I'm sorry you can't really see it, but it's not really necessary because at every half an hour from four views over a six hour period. So some of these 24 hour observations of just being there. Again, I think it's this obsession and passion. <clears throat> so another way of looking at that area is maybe to make a list of the sort of features or monuments, whether it be the chemist or the school or the convenience store. Maybe you locate them or conventionally on a map. But maybe more interestingly or more revealingly, you can find out when it's open and who might use it. So you can begin to understand about how those sorts of overlaps and systems work and why certain things happen near bus stops uh, or a different stall. So really how the city starts working as an organic environment. Another way to look at the city might be by color. Why don't we look at that? So taking a blurry photo and, and seeing the different colors. What color is Jakarta? Um, or looking at sort of quantities. So this student, again, trying to look at the phenomenon of 7-Eleven, found out how many packets of cigarettes were consumed a day. So maybe why everyone made multiple stops. And then contrasted that with the very personal in terms of how many cigarettes she smoked a day. Not that we should be encouraging that, but, but again, I think an individual's map of the city is as important and as valid as everyone else. So we're all citizens, whether we're designing um, as designers or designing for others. Another interesting thing, I think, is to use the yellow pages or walk around and make lists of what might be in an area and begin to speculate. I think we begin to pose questions like, why are there 62 restaurants and uh, 15 traditional therapists and no auto mechanic or hairdresser. So does that mean as designers we should make every community self-sufficient? Should we add those? Or do certain areas become specialized? So again, these are just tools to enable ourselves to ask questions. Or we might begin to compare with something that we know. And this is one of my favorite drawings. Because this is Melbourne's chaotic cafe street. <laughs> Look at how organized it is. As opposed to Taipei, where you can see the pedestrians and the cars and the bicycles all moving together. So again, how a city organizes in a way. And this is wild for, you know, look at this. The pavement blocked by cafes, uh, big tables. <clears throat> um, and again, some comparative studies. So how you might begin to know, understand someplace and what it's like and how you might organize it. <laughs> It's really quite a wonderful place. I love Taipei, if you haven't noticed. And then how we might use photography, interestingly. I always dissuade my students from using photography as an analytical tool, because there's too much information in it. How do you begin to erase some of the things in the picture? So again, you can see the, the picture of a nighttime street scene, the student erasing it, and then really coming down to some of the key variables. And where an approach like this might be useful is that this sky, this jagged skyline, and that, that sort of glimpse of sky became a, a huge design device for her. So she was actually going to design for glimpses of sky. So design your buildings to make good sky. <clears throat> I 
again, how we might then start recording or, or really pushing some of these phenomena and these students to case studies of mobile structures or mobile um, businesses such as fortune tellers. So, so described it, understood how it worked, defined it as a sort of a, a typology that it survived within the city because it was mobile and there was levels of mobility, some were in the same place every day, some places were in different places every day, so how mobile it was, different examples of it, and then diagramming how it might work in an afternoon is set up here in a big street amongst other stalls and packed up at night. So where do those market stalls go at night? Has anyone ever thought about that? What is the dynamic of unpacking and making the city survive? And again, another sort of study, there's a huge mobile culture in, in, um, in, in Taipei, so some which are carts, some which are trolleys, and some which are mobile that are permanent, the wheels are off and up on concrete blocks. And then how that might evolve from the hawker blight bike with plans all the way down to the department store. So different ways of maybe selling with different characters in a city. So you could actually trace a dim sum and, and figure out all the different ways that you might get it. Or the ubiquitous McDonald's. How, what is a local McDonald's? What makes up a McDonald's? So again, one in Taipei, but then finding out what is local about them and what aren't local about them. So there's, you know, the menus, the price changes, the branded space, but then these unplanned activities, which maybe are some of these things from the bottom up, and how as designers can we allow for the unplanned, such as um, the use by the homeless, or a semi-public space for scooter parking, which these students recognize, or the playroom as a child-minding and waiting center. So again, perhaps some of these sorts of facilities in different places act as public spaces or social spaces. So again, when you're writing a design brief, maybe you add some of those things in. And then the sort of the range of a ubiquitous model and what the, the local op opportunities might be, from Japanese mo burgers to, to local food. So again, how do you work on that local global scale? And then what are the people like? who use it? How are they different? So again, I think a lot of these bottom-up approaches are looking at things that we might take for granted, but are very much part of the city that we're designing for. Um, we, we really formalize some of these conversations into what I call now urban diaries. So stories of the city and tales of the city. So really thinking of the city as a sort of almost human or, or something that grows and lives and, and accommodates us socially. So one way of looking at the city in this case was to look at something terribly banal, like a tele, uh, post box. So look at the same post box over six hours and then finding all 16 post boxes in the district. And then even pushing it further of then looking at the postman's route. And when I said that the maps lie, this is the same map as the first map that I showed you. But this one is designed by the postman, so he's got a different map. So they're all biased. The postman's map is very different from the property owner's map. So I think as architects and designers, we need to draw our own maps, which have the information in them that we need and want. Um, another <coughs> urban diary. Original versus pirate is the diary of two seemingly similar Louis Vuitton handbags. And you can sort of see the different straps and the, that's the real, which is six to 18,000 um, Taiwanese dollars and that one's $1,200. So, uh, but what really became interesting uh, was looking at the sale of each over an eight minute period. And that's in Sogo department store. And I realized by looking at this why I hate department stores. <laughs> Static and nothing moving. When there's a sort of a sale of the pirate is a really sort of wonderful series of negotiations in street life. So where do we position how we might say, sell these sorts of urban negotiations? Um, and then trying to understand a very popular ice cream, mango ice store in Taipei which um, gets crowds on a uh, crowded pedestrian street 
So these students did a 24-hour stay gap, they did questionnaires, and found out where people came from. And these drawings became really revealing to me. In the morning, you could see the shop, which is probably an illegal structure, um, but, but actually taking over a bit of a neighboring block. In mid-afternoon, those crazy cars coming in and congesting the street. Uh, more and more people. And then something really interesting happened at peak time. And I said, what happened in that gap? And apparently the Mango Ice Store employs a bouncer. So that the um, frontage of the neighboring Japanese restaurant isn't blocked. And I thought, what extraordinary negotiation where neighbors can actually work that way. Whereas in most Western cultures, we have such strong planning laws that we forget how at grassroots level, a lot of us can actually negotiate and take care with what's happening on either side. So it was really, we only would have discovered that by actually doing this 24-hour stay cap. So again, it's like, how do we learn? How do we see? And then how do we make sense of um, what we've observed? And, and this one's my favorite urban diary, um, which is the diary of a garbage truck. And there's no rubbish collection in Taipei to individual houses. There's no bins on the street. So in the neighborhood that I lived in, the rubbish truck came at 7 o'clock on a Monday night. And you knew it was coming because it played Mozart's or Beethoven's for, for release, classical music. Um, digitally, so everyone came, so we all took our garbage bags to the truck. And I thought this was wonderful. It was like a gathering of the village green, and, and you know, I met all my neighbors, and apparently I had valuable rubbish, so people took it and recycled and got money from it for me. I didn't know how to do that. And, and it was fantastic, and then everyone dispersed. And in Taipei, the garbage, uh, Taichung, the garbage trucks teach English. So every week you get a new phrase by the friendly garbage truck. And they do recycling and so I thought this was absolutely wonderful. And here's some sort of details. It was nighttime, but you can see the sort of, you know, those sorts of activities and, and that sort of community spirit. Well, the students who did this project disagreed with me. They thought this was terrible. What happens in a typhoon and you have to take your rubbish in the rain? And what happens to the elderly? or the disabled. And I think the nice thing about this approach is that you can actually produce the evidence, but then people can have differing opinions. And it's always, I think, maybe I shouldn't tell you this, but you don't have to always agree with your tutor. I'm much more of a romantic than my students were. So I thought this was lovely, and they thought it was terrible. So then how you might turn this into a project. So I'll show you three or four projects. So because they thought this was terrible to have to carry it, and this was where it was collected in this little um, urban green. That they thought that maybe, when the whole district was a 10 minute walk, that walking five minutes was reasonable. So they have five, three five minute um, places. But then they researched where the rubbish went to and thought about logistics and garbage trucks on the road and congestion and environmental planning by uh, disaster to take it to the periphery. And they said, well, maybe you can be responsible for a lot of this on site. So they saw a school, and they thought, well, we can put, um, students can do recycling and learn about environmental things. There was a series of uh, Japanese houses that had been abandoned. So maybe as they're recycling goods, maybe they can also recycle buildings. So we really need to sort of consider how generous our projects are not now. How much they'll be able to be changed and adapted uh, and grow as the city grows and changes and evolves. So, you know, what happened with these? Whoops, sorry. <laughs> oh, I didn't do that. Sorry. <laughs> That's not. <laughs> but we, we can see that as we make those sorts of connections, <laughs> all of a sudden you have huge green streets and networks and a whole lane system now that's populated by gardens and organic sites. As you can start seeing in these vegetable patches. Another project based on that sort of observation is these traces that another student found of a ladder here, um, a bicycle, all these things in yellow boxes. And so she wondered what was going on, researched the homeless, and was heard that there was very little, but found all these traces of occupation in the city. 
So all these yellow, yellow areas were, were near the highway and the dike in East part of Taipei. So then she started looking at the type of infrastructure that supported this appropriation of urban space. So again, from the bottom up, these are big highways, but this little niche in the highway was, someone was living there. So it provided a sort of a house or a safe sheltered space. <coughs> looking at the map after that, after making those original observations, she looked at the infrastructure where she found traces of these um, activities and added more infrastructure, sort of bicycle and motorbike routes across the river. So you can see the sort of sites of these activities. And through the section, the, the, the dike, the highway system. So she added more. But she thought she would design this infrastructure to be generous, to offer those sorts of spaces that might be appropriated by other people living there, or people for a picnic, or but again, it does a little bit more than just provide space for motorbikes. So she looked at ways of getting over the walls, making holes at least the dikes. She looked at ways of, of splitting the thin walls, um, again, produ producing dikes, but maybe having niches or spaces where something else might happen, different activities might happen. Um, other ways of getting through, and also ways of developing the foreshore on the other side. So you could actually make places where people could pull up their boats and fishing boats to have a picnic when there wasn't any storms. Um, so again, even have something that big, like an infrastructure move, if you consider all scale simultaneously, which I always ask my students, if you're working at one to a thousand or a big urban scale, imagine it at one to one or one to twenty as you're walking past it piece of furniture because we confront and work with a city of multiple scales simultaneously. Um, another project, and I'll show you just two more of how this approach can do something, of congestion, which is a very Jakarta <laughs> issue, isn't it? Uh, and students sat outside and watched the sort of traffic, which was pretty continuous night and day. Taiwan has these big 12-lane roads, um, so they watch cars. And I think the standard response, or the user-friendly response, is to pedestrianize everything, to exclude the cars. Um, so this was a sort of first move where you might put a running track through the area. But then they sort of decided, well, you know, why not try to make cars, pedestrians, and motorbikes coexist simultaneously? So they looked at how wide the roads might be, so the pedestrians needed less space, obviously, than cars and motorcycles, if you see the sort of section cut through there, and then looked at the streets in this area of existing wide boulevards and smaller ones, more contained streets. So they decided that instead of excluding things, they might make some of them fast, some of them slow, and some of them very still. So how do you actually start to choreograph, almost like a dance movement, how these might work without being exclusive. Um, so this is where this map comes in again. So one of the reasons they felt um, was a problem was that all the congestion with the illegal structures. But as I said, the illegal structures are the spirit of Taipei. And these are some of my favorite drawings. So this is what Taipei should have looked like before it was filled in. So you can see that you can get through, um, through the lanes, you know, the through streets. But then when you actually see, all those streets are blocked. So we call these the swollen rice drawings. <laughs> so I love doing this. So you can actually see how just add water and it swells up. And then how on an urban scale, that's the unclogged or original city. And then there it is clogged. So they didn't want to necessarily remove anything because, again, they didn't feel that that was their judgment call to do that to deprive people of their businesses, but maybe they could rearrange them. So they did a few moves. They unclogged it, that's the original. They removed the illegal structures, then they did something that they called, again, a conceptual move of just sliding the city a bit, and then sliding it at the upper level. So we can see a detail. Here's a little portion of the city. We can see the roads, the laneways, the hierarchy of roads. And what happens if they slid it? Well, you make sort of nice little piazzas here, and yes, you can still get through there, but it's not encouraged. So that would slow you down, and maybe only a motorbike or pedestrian get through. And then these roads 
maybe it would be a little bit faster, so you could be encouraged to go that way. And again, they did it here, but every time they remove something, like remove this bit, they put it someplace else. So that was one of their rules. They could rearrange, but they weren't going to remove anything. Um, so this is how they worked in plan and section. So you can see, and this is typical of Taipei, which it really doesn't look like that original drawing. Because um, it's very congested. And the first thing I saw in Taipei was a car going down the street like this and getting stuck. <laughs> I was amazed. So they proposed that they might unclog that street, you know, put a little illegal structure there, an external stair, stair and a passageway through. They might do that in that condition and have a park for picnics. And on this street, they might clog it further. So that's where they put the other stuff, so they would slow cars down there. So again, it's a, it's a way of actually dealing with the existing typology in a sensitive way, and almost surgical uh, precision, instead of knocking down huge areas, maybe you could actually work quite carefully with local knowledge, and specifically. And I'll end in this project, which I, which I always like to show students, because I think your personal viewpoint as a designer and deciding who you are as a designer and how you want to operate is really important. Um, and this was a Turkish student who came from Australia and she was very uncomfortable in Taipei because she didn't know what she could photograph or not. So when she saw, you know, washing, hanging out, uh, and, you know, being able to look into, sorry, it's so dark from here, but look into someone's living room, she was sort of saying, you know, am I intruding on their public realm? She was on the public street, but on their private realm. So she didn't know what was private, what was public, but instead of calling it private and public, she said places she could photograph or not. And here's the you know, public realm, private realm coming into the street, and people hanging out with their birds, shops filling into the street. So she started drawing on her photographs of all these sorts of zones. And I suppose, again, this is sort of um, deconstructing that map, which had those, you know, those um, clear delineations. So she started really seeing the complexity of layers of inside and outside in, in Taipei. It was a very, very simple device of, with her own vocabulary of what she could photograph and not, of, of this sort of overlapping layers. Um, and looked again, and so you can see underneath the, the order here, and then that's actually what it's really like. Um, so she overlaid on a large scale map because you can get big from the bottom up approach. You can do urban design, but you start from the bottom. So she mapped an area which had a lot of public buses, a sort of a public bus station, and big road through here. And you can see that sort of hierarchy of streets, of lanes. And so she mapped there what she could, um, what she could, um, places she thought she could go illegally occupied territories. There was a lot of small bus stations and small businesses. And then decided to add to that language. 